Good morning. So can I acknowledge a few uh, folks real quick? How many of you noticed the lighting was a little bit better during worship today? And how many of you noticed Miss Jen walking around with a new camera? So all of that, um, let me start here. We just signed a contract um, for the best slot Thursday nights at 8 p.m. starting in March on the Grace Awakening Network. We're going to be streamed into 75 million homes. Yep. So that's, that's a huge step for us. Um, the, the people that own the network, it's actually the seminary that I am a student of and the publisher that I'm published by. They partnered and they, um, they purchased this network and it's going to be Grace, New Creation Teaching um, all day long. And they gave us the selection of the best slot, the slot that we wanted. So Thursday evenings, 8 p.m. Um, and immediately when I announced this to our leaders, they wanted to step up their game. So they started looking at cameras. They started looking at lights. Aaron Jones has been here Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and at 6.30 this morning um, to, to enhance our lighting picture here. And Alec Alderman, who is our, uh, the, the senior leader of our camera team back there, he's working right now. Um, he's been doing tons of research and development on our camera setup. So we have seven cameras active on a Sunday morning. Um, you might not see six of them because they're above your head, and the newest one is the one that Miss Jen was walking around with this morning. Um, but can you imagine this gospel going... Right now, um, I mean, we just saw a huge uptick in our online audience, but uh, before that, we were being listened to in 2,900 cities and 90 countries. That's insane. New Philadelphia is known in 2,900 cities in 90 nations. It's unbelievable, but I wanted to say thank you. Aaron, Alec, you guys are doing fantastic work. I wanted to acknowledge you for that. All right, so, so as promised, we are taking a turn. We're starting a new series. The series is called Heaven Here, Heaven Now. Yep, you might have seen that statement uh, a place or two at Legacy Church, maybe on the back of everyone's t-shirts, maybe on signs at the door. Uh, it's something that we're wildly passionate about. But this is what I want to lead into. I want you to know that we're coming out of the Unveiled series only to unveil something else, okay? Wildly important, let me say it this way, we do not gather around doctrine, we gather around family. You do not have to agree to belong. That will never be the situation. Agreement, as a matter of fact, is the most shallow ground that you can ever form a relationship on. Because when you disagree, you're no longer in a relationship, right? Maybe this would be a good social media policy for you all. <laughs> but let me also insert this piece of information. Doctrine matters. The reason doctrine matters is because you will frame your future by your expectations. So you might think that it doesn't really matter what you believe, it's all going to shake out in the end and you'll find out what was, what was true, but that is not how God intended for the kingdom to work. What God did is he gave humanity dominion over the earth so they bring about what they expect, okay? Okay. So the, the most subtle yet the most destructive thing that an enemy of the kingdom could do would be to introduce a doctrine that produces exactly the opposite of what God intends, okay? And it's not, it doesn't seem dangerous. As a matter of fact, it seems noble and it seems holy because it's not coming from the mouth of the devil. It's coming from the mouth of a preacher most of the time, right? So if God's intention from the beginning was to have human beings that look like God govern a creation that looks like heaven, and then he puts them in dominion, not only over that moment or that, that acreage in Eden, but he also tells them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, then the most destructive thing that you can do is create a doctrine that says you're not like God and you're supposed to leave earth. That's the most destructive thing that you can offer someone, right? So if your faith causes you to be envious of dead people, and that might sound shocking, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you where most Westerners, like when they're at a funeral, they think the person in the box has it better than the person giving the eulogy, right? 
If your faith causes you to be envious of dead people, then you have not believed in the doctrine of the Bible. You've believed in the doctrine of the traditions of our fathers. So what happens when you have poor doctrine is your doctrine becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? So Pastor Aaron told a story this morning about Adam and how Adam did not change physically or even emotionally after he ate of the tree. The only thing that changed was his perspective of himself. And then Romans chapter 8 says that, that all of creation was delivered into bondage because of what Adam believed. And that Romans 8 desires that sons of God manifest on earth so that creation could be delivered into the glorious liberty of beloved sons. So your Bible says that as goes the church, so goes creation. So if the church is obsessed with dying and leaving, guess what we're going to see? Yep, do you understand? We won't gather around doctrine. We, you don't have to agree to belong. But the importance of doctrine is crucial. As a matter of fact, the reason that fivefold ministers exist is to keep you from being blown around by every wind of doctrine. Right? So it's important. The local church makes it safe to explore, but will also confront your error. You get it? You guys awake? Okay, so if you are waiting on heaven to suck you away so that you don't have to deal with a seven-year tribulation, you have wrong doctrine, right? The Bible says of the increase and of his government, there will be no end. If you are watching the news and prophesying to your friends that I've read the end of this book, brother, it's going to get worse, then it will get worse by your faith. Your faith and doctrine will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. God says that once the Messiah comes, the Messiah will place his government on your shoulders, and then of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So if you're waiting on an end, if you're waiting on a departure, if you're waiting on death, your doctrine has been turned on its head because the intention was for life and dominion, not death and escape. Yeah. Doctrine matters. Get it? So, in this series, the title of this message is Acreage and Offspring. And it's something subtle that I think needs just confronted, addressed, maybe to give you a little bit more confidence in why you're here and what you do. But what happens often in the local church is we become obsessed with the means, but we forget about the end, okay? And I'll say some things real quick. I've said them before, but they're a little bit shocking, but your Bible is a result of sin, okay? Worship services are a result of sin. Fivefold ministry is a result of sin. Right? All of these things exist to bring us back to something that was before the distortion. All of these, this book is to lead you to the word. That word is to lead you to your origin so that you know who you were in him before the foundation of the world. Right? Had Adam believed what God said about him, you wouldn't need this because his nature would be telling enough of the father that he could examine himself to know who he was. Okay? So here's what I'm saying. You are not a good Christian because you read the Bible. You're not a good Christian because you come to church. You're not a good Christian because you play an instrument. You're not a good Christian because you worship. Christians are responsible for acreage and offspring. You are supposed to change cities, and you are supposed to produce sons. All of these things lead to that thing. And if you have a counterfeit correlation to a problem then you will feel like you're doing something to advance the kingdom, but you're not, right? How many of you have ever had one of those really like, oh, I hope nobody has one on because this can get really insensitive really fast. <laughs> uh, those lapel pins, like a pink ribbon or a yellow ribbon or a purple ribbon or whatever, right? Flag, flag ribbon, yeah, or a wristband. I hate those things. 
I hate them. Here's why. Because they give you a counterfeit connection to a problem without ever requiring you to become a solution to it. Right? <laughs> like, what'd you do for breast cancer today? I wore my ribbon. <laughs> okay. What's the result? Hmm. Okay? Now, why am I saying that? Not to pick on ribbons and breast cancer and whatever. What I'm saying is, what'd you do today? I read my Bible. Okay? How's New Philly look? How's your block look? Are you investing in sons? Are you coming to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Does New Philadelphia look like heaven on earth? Because if not, you wasted your time. Yep. The realms that you're experiencing need translated to the world that you're responsible for. We can get obsessed with being Christians that we never become sons. Acreage and offspring. Where did I get this title? Well, I'm really clever. Two, Genesis chapter one. Be fruitful, offspring, right? Fill the earth, and subdue it, acreage. There has to be tangible, evident results of you being a son or you've been duped into thinking that your activity is your responsibility. It's not your activity, it's your fruit. Right? So, just because people are really critical of my teaching, I'm not saying that the Bible's bad or worship's bad or the local church is bad. I'm saying all of these serve a purpose and they in themselves are not the end. They are the means. Right? They are to get you somewhere and that somewhere is heaven on earth right? Not to make it through judgment, not to get you to a rapture, but so that you may influence and impact everything that you have responsibility over. Yep. Heaven here, heaven now. Where did I get that? Well, I'm really clever. No, Matthew chapter 6. How should we pray, Jesus? Well, how about this? Our Father that's in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom Yep, yep. Did it say that I would escape? Yeah. Nope, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth. as it is in. Yeah. Yep, so doesn't that sound like a different gospel than it's been preached through, through the West? Yeah. Right, we've, we've actually avoided responsibility. As a matter of fact, most of the messages that you hear just say, turn on CNN, build a bunker, and wait for Jesus to come. <laughs> you won't find that here. You can't find any agreement with that principle in your Bible. Psalm 1, uh, yeah, let's talk about this, okay? So, the future of creation has one hope. It's not Jesus. It's not the rapture. It's not the end of the world. It's the manifestation of the sons of God. That's it. That's what Romans chapter 8 says, right? As a matter of fact, Jesus is waiting. He's tapped us in, and he has taken a seat. Psalm 110, I think. Yeah, it's 110 verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Right? So in his resurrection, he sat at the right hand of God, and then he elected you to finish the work to do the will of the Father, Father in the body that he has prepared for you. You get it? You guys are going to have to wake up. Yep, you're all going to have to wake up. So do you see why doctrine matters? And, and let me, I know we've talked about this before, but let me give you a little bit of a pattern, all right? So in Genesis, the devil simply came with a religious message. He just came to distract Adam from what he was actually supposed to do. Adam was who he needed to be to accomplish his mission. All that the devil did was told him that he had to do something to qualify himself to accomplish his mission. All he did was got him confounded by the means so he forgot about the end. If you drive past any, like go up 77 and look at all the church signs on the left and right side of the road. Preparing for revival, preparing for war, preparing for this. You've done been prepared when he placed you in himself, rid you of everything you were never meant to be, and raised you and seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. 
Okay, we're not preparing for anything. It's time to do it now. Definitely not preparing for death and rapture. I don't think we've ever just like come out and said it. We teach tremendous eschatology, but the rapture is bogus. Okay, sorry. Okay, if you are a trouble, ready? If you are a Christian in your issue with Mormonism, is that it came to a man through a dream, and then they wrote a book about it, then you should have a huge issue with the rapture, right? Because it came through an eighth grade girl in a dream 150 years ago. Yep, and then it was elected by a pastor that taught his people. And then, believe it or not, it actually fizzled out. It fizzled out in the 1800s. And then Israel became a nation in 1946, and everyone was like, oh, this is that. So they brought it back. The doctrine of the rapture is younger than most of your grandparents. Yep, so Jesus surely wasn't familiar with it. Paul wasn't familiar with it. Polycarp wasn't familiar with it. Gregory of Nazianzus wasn't familiar with it. Origen wasn't familiar with it. Generations upon generations upon generations of church fathers, including the cornerstone himself, not familiar with it. Okay? I might have just stolen some of your hope. If your hope is in the future and not in the past, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then your hope is a rapture. Excuse me. Your Savior is a rapture. Yep. Or death is your Savior. Jesus will not stand for death being his competition. Okay. So Acts chapter 3, you don't have to turn here, I'm just going to make some notes and then we're going to get into really some, uh, I'd say, theological side of things. Acts chapter 3 is the first presentation of the New Testament gospel, right? They're baptized in the Holy Spirit, they come down out of the upper room, Peter starts preaching. The first time that any actual converts are made post-resurrection. And this is the gospel that he presents to them. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Okay? Isn't that a much more palatable gospel? Isn't it a much more hopeful gospel? right? We have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that re-qualified. It was a salvific moment for humanity to bring them back to who they already and always were so that they could come back to their original intention, which was influence through acreage and offspring. You change territories and you change people. Whom heaven received, Jesus Christ, whom heaven received until, everybody say until, Times of restoration of all things. Not a rapture, not a certain death, not the end of the world, until earth looks like heaven. So if you have poor doctrine, you will abandon your assignment. If you have poor doctrine, you will abandon your assignment. Get it? Okay, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. You want to know where your doctrine, well, not not the source of your doctrine, but do you want to know why you're okay with your doctrine? Everything starts with your theology, right? Theology is your understanding of God. And if you believe that God is punitive, then your entire system will have to be judicial. Right? Your entire system will have to be judicial. So after your theology becomes judicial, then your soteriology is judicial, which is your your understanding of salvation. Well, if God is judicial, then I needed saved from his judgment. Right? Which, again, not a biblical concept. And if your soteriology is judicial, then your eschatology, which is your study of what's coming, will be judicial. I believe in a future judgment, right? And all of these things have to fit this window. But we just spent 10 weeks talking about the Christus Victor, first century view of who God is. God's entire um, pursuit was trying to bring humanity back into himself. So if that is salvific, then, then his intention is that you and he would become one. It's not judicial, it's relational. And if your whole system now becomes relational, then your salvation is a relational 
right? Fix, not a judicial fix. And if your soteriology becomes relational, then the future has to become relational too. What's his intention? He's, he has re- excuse me, reconciled us unto himself, and then he's given you the ministry of reconciliation as though God were in you reconciling the world to himself, right? So that's the gospel, right? The whole picture now fits who you believe God is. If you thought God was judicial, you have to make up a bunch of other systems to fit who you think he is. Yep, and if that's not who he is, then the rest of your systems come crumbling down. And that's great. Yep, that's great. Okay, so the first presentation of the gospel was heaven received Jesus until we fix everything. Yep, heaven received Jesus until we fix everything. Um, there's a doctrine in, in that that most theologians would understand as the doctrine of the appointed time. That means that there are certain things that God has placed in the hands of men and not, and not in the hands of God. For instance, the flood. Do you know Noah determined when the flood happened? It happened when he finished the boat. He could have taken 20 years. He could have taken 2,000 years. But when the door shut, it started raining. Right? No one knows the day or the hour. It's because it's not appointed. It's up to you. Haven't received Jesus until. Times of restoration of all things, right? So the faster you turn New Philly into heaven, and the faster you produce acreage and offspring, right? We have an issue. Can we talk about the issue? Social media is the issue, right? Having a social media ministry doesn't create sons. It doesn't take territories. The local church is the hope of the world. I don't care if you have 20,000 subscribers, if you aren't building something. If you don't have a blueprint, Paul was a wise master builder. When he wrote letters, he wrote them to cities, right? Not LLCs. We've determined that if we travel, if we create resources, any of those things, we don't accept every invite. We accept invites to travel where we know acreage and offspring will be produced. Yet we only go see people we're going to be in relationships with. That's it. We're not there to to be cheerleaders. We're not there to blow their minds with our revelation. We're there because there's a demographic that needs the gospel of the kingdom. And there are people there that are sons. And those sons want to produce more sons that influence actual territory. Get it? So there's this, uh, no, I'm not going to pick on everything today. We'll, we'll continue. Go to Matthew 28. We'll talk about this for a moment. You guys okay? Did you guys enjoy the worship team this morning? Those guys are second to none. Okay, I want to reframe what, what you commonly know as the Great Commission, all right, which we've taken as a good suggestion. The Great Commission is literally the blessing of Jesus before his resurrection and his instruction on what we should do, what we should do um, concerning his departure, right? Matthew 28 says, this is verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded uh, you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age Amen. Okay, so again, your theology will determine how you see this verse. But there's something specific in this verse that you have to responsibly pick out to realize that this is not a commandment to go to coffee shops with Bibles. Yep. Make disciples of all nations does not mean that you put a little packet in a folder and you go through a class with somebody. The word nations, which was the Greek word ethnos, And in zero of the definitions does it have to do with people. Ethnos is a territory or a culture. So your responsibility that Jesus placed on humanity was to make disciples of your cities. Not just individuals, although that is one of the root ways that we make those things happen. But we're literally here to show earth how heaven does life in extremely practical ways extremely practical ways. I want to make that clear. Our existence 
is a mystical existence. Think about this. You and I are one with Christ seated in the right, at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Right? That's insane. Like, who can even comprehend that with your natural mind? Well, nobody, which is why he had to give you his mind. But here's the next part of that. Territories don't get changed by your encounters. Territories get changed when your encounter turns into how to love your wife. Territories get changed when your encounters turn into how you handle disputes with a fellow human. Territories get changed when your mystical existence turns into how you treat strangers at Walmart, right? I know this sounds simple, but you and I are literally responsible to establish the culture of heaven on earth. Jesus had zero, zero prophetic seminars. Jesus had zero healing workshops. Jesus did zero, zero discipleships. Jesus spent his entire life making his life make sense by saying the kingdom of God is like. Jesus had a woman who was caught in adultery thrown at his feet. Religion picked up stones because they knew God throws stones clearly. Now we have the express image of the Father standing there looking at this woman on the ground in shame. He causes all of those men to drop their stones to prove that the Father's not punitive. And he makes heaven make sense to everybody standing around him. And when you make heaven make sense to the people standing around you, the only people that get upset with you are the religious ones. Yep. So do you understand how practical this is supposed to be? Right? We have our Bibles. We have our encounters. We have our worship service. All of these things are tremendous, and they are a means to bringing the reality of heaven to earth. The reason we we have like a dozen people right now looking for houses in New Philadelphia so they can move to be part of this right? You don't move to a YouTube station, right? You move to a family. And you move to a family because you want to be part of something for the first time ever where on your very worst day, you're still safe. Yep. You want to move and be part of something where you can just like, have you, I know you've been here, but where the world is collapsing on your shoulders and you accidentally pop off at the mouth at somebody, right? Or you forget to call somebody back or whatever it is. And you know that I will take a bullet for you. I will take a bullet from you. We're not going anywhere because we are literally in the center of New Philadelphia to display how heaven does life. Yep. It's that simple. On the worst day of your life, on the worst day of your life, you're still safe. Get it? People aren't moving here because of our doctrine. They can get our doctrine on a hundred other YouTube channels. They're moving here because we're a family. Good? Okay. Ethnos. A multitude associated or living together, a company, a troop, a swarm, a multitude of the same nature a tribe. Okay, so this isn't individuals. These are collective, right? This is, this is the culture of a region. So he says, make disciples of regions and teach them everything that I taught you. Jesus didn't teach anyone to behave. He taught them how heaven operated. Every sermon that Jesus started, started with the kingdom of God is like, right? He couldn't tell you the kingdom of God is because you wouldn't have language to process that stuff. But what he has to do is make it palatable He translates his encounter, his face-to-face moments with the Father, into something that actually affects both acreage and offspring. Get it? Our mystical proclivities have relegated our experiences to supernatural encounters, but the gospel was meant to expand through offspring and acreage. True quantifiable transformation through lineage and territory. You ready? Sometimes I write things when I'm in a bad mood. I'm just kidding. But the way that I wrote them is usually a lot more bold than the way that I would say them, so I'm going to read you what I wrote instead of watering it down. We can no longer jump from conference to conference to get high on our own anointing without committing to heaven's culture in our homes, 
workplaces, churches, and businesses. The kingdom doesn't expand outside of people and places, acreage and offspring, territory and lineage. So if Jesus, if his great commission is to teach them everything that I taught you, what did he teach us? The kingdom of God is like. He taught us how heaven does life. He taught us what heaven values. He taught us what, how heaven um, solves disagreements. He taught us who heaven judges. Right? And one of the main things that I hope you took away from the last 10 weeks is that the Father and the Son are one. And if there's a, a, a misunderstanding between who you say the Father is and who the Son demonstrated him to be, the Son is the express image of the Father. The fullness of the Godhead bodily is who he is, right? So if the son had the opportunity to throw stones and rather told this woman, I judge no one, he and the father are one and they're not in disagreement, right? So he taught us about judgment. There are many mandates for the church to reach individuals, but the Great Commission in Matthew 28 was not one of them. The Great Commission was a mandate for the church to change culture by displaying the life of the kingdom. If we aren't careful and contextual, we'll think that Jesus only wants us to teach bad people to do good things rather than replace the culture of our city with the culture of the kingdom. Right? Turn to Acts 17. I want to show you something. You guys awake? How many of you are doing the Revelator Challenge? You know how we have 300 people all across the globe in the Transfigure Challenge? This one should double. This one should double. Amen? Okay, Acts 17. I'm going to read the whole thing, 1 through 7, just so we can get to the last part. But I want to show you what the fruit of the gospel was. Now, mind you, contextually, Matthew 28 was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've only got seven chapters here of, of New Testament church history. So this is very early, very early, right after they received the commission to go make disciples of all nations. This is how those nations are seeing them. Ready? They pass through and. Uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, where they were in a synagogue of the Jews. Paul, as his custom was, went into them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas." But the Jews, who were not persuaded, became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace. They gathered a mob. They set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These have turned the world upside down, have come here too. The word world was the Greek word cosmos, which literally meant culture. It was the agreement that they have with life. The people that didn't like them still said the most flattering thing that could ever be said of a local group of believers. They're changing everything. Do you know why they changed everything? The next confession, there's a new king. That's what they said. There's a new king, Jesus. There's a new leader. There's a new culture. There's a new structure. There's a new reality for you to contemplate, which is why the first thing that Peter told the disciples to do was repent. Change the way you think because the kingdom of God is accessible. Even the people that oppose them knew that they were completely upsetting the balance of everything that they understood. Those who turned the world upside down are here now. What they did in all the other places were doomed to the same fate. Legacy Church is in New Philadelphia. Now it's in Kentucky. Now it's in Dallas. It's heading to Jacksonville. They're all in equal amounts of trouble. Do you get it? Acreage and offspring. 
cities and people. Not encounters, not reading, not conferences, cities and people. That's what we're called to. Good? All right. So, where do we want to go? Matthew 10. Verse 7. It says, as you go, preach. Ready? I want to stop there, actually. As you go, preach. Okay, so this makes the expansion of the kingdom way more passive than we think it is. Like, sometimes you think you need to raise funds, go on a missions trip, or, like, go get a guitar and a coffee can and sit at the mall. Like, this is as you go. Right? So you have a plan anyway. Right? You're heading to work, you're heading to church, wherever you might be. Your job then is not to find somewhere to preach the gospel. Your job is to be a representation or a manifestation of the gospel to everybody that you encounter. As you go, proclaim, right? Make sense of your life. That's all Jesus had to do. They asked him what he had, and he had to make sense of his life by saying the kingdom of God is like. That's what he did to Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, I've been through all of the religious schools. I've climbed to the top rung of the ladder. I don't have what you have. And he said, well, if you return to your origin, you'll see the kingdom. Yep. He explained that Jesus accessed and was governed by a reality that he wasn't aware of. And if you access and begin to be governed by that reality, then you'll be able to do the same things he did. As you go, preach. (laughs) saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. You don't have to have a healing service as you go, right? If you see, Paul Paul, um, referenced a Greek word. The, The Greek word was metrons. The English word that he uses is spheres, okay? And it's exactly what you think it is. It's the areas where you can make a difference. Some have big spheres. Some are the, the, the leaders of their families. Some rub elbows with the, the CEO of their company, whatever it might be. There's nobody else that gets to take responsibility for your sphere. And the way that the kingdom expands is simply by you taking responsibility for the areas that you already have influence in. Tell them there's a kingdom, and then show them. Proclamation followed by demonstration is how we influence acreage and offspring. Good? Okay. I promise I'm almost done. I don't think I want to go where I thought I was going to go. I will. So when we bring new students into the kingdom, excuse me, (laughs) into the school, I guess it's kind of the same. Um, When we bring new students into the school, our first night is discussing the difference between overt and covert ministry. And if you've been around Christianity for any length of time, then you'll see that things seem to ebb and flow. We have movements, and the movements start, and then they die. And then they start again, and then they die. It's a prophetic movement, right? And then there's gone. And then there's a healing movement, and then it's gone. There's a revival, and then it's gone, right? Those those things are never intended to go. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So if it ends, it did not accomplish that which it was set out to do. Okay, so here's the solution. And this is why Jesus did what he did. Because realistically, think of, think of the Adam's sin affected everyone. Right? 
Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection affected everyone. So if Adam didn't have to teach people how to be influenced by what he accomplished, then neither did Jesus. But he did. He spent three and a half years making heaven make sense to people so that the culture would be able to carry what heaven was bringing. Because I can tell you that most of the time, the reason that things end isn't because God stops them. It's because humans can't handle them. Right? It's because we can't get along. It's because we can't settle disagreements. It's because we can't be in a family without being in agreement. It's because we don't know how to handle offense. It's because we don't know how to not judge one another. So everything that Jesus did in his three and a half years between the institution of his earthly ministry and his resurrection was simply letting people know how heaven functions. So not only do you have the overt expressions of ministry, like, should we heal the sick? You got it, right? Should we have prophetic conferences? You bet. Should we operate in words of knowledge? Sure. But 1 Corinthians 13 says that you're useless and annoying if you do all of those outside of the right culture. Right? So it's possible. As a matter of fact, it's going to happen. The Bible says that the gifts won't function after that which is perfect comes about. So the gifts are not the, hmm, they're not the emphasis. The culture's the emphasis. So when a movement, a movement that's defined by its gifts and not its culture, then the poor culture will put an end to the movement of the gifts. Get it? Does it make sense? So we're in a position where we're pioneering a movement. We're on the forefront of what God's doing in creation. You better believe that the way we handle one another is the most important thing that we can focus on right now. You better believe that our offenses and the way those are handled and our ability to stay unified even if we disagree is the most important thing that we can talk about. Covert ministry is the solution to hypocrisy. If you can heal the sick and beat your wife, I don't care about your kingdom. But if you love your wife and can't heal the sick, I'll let you preach. You get the emphasis? If it's temporary, it's not the emphasis. Gifts, callings, offices, anointings, all of those are the means by which we bring about that which is perfect. So if we sacrifice that which is perfect on the altar of the means, we will mishandle what God has trusted us to appropriate to creation. Get it? The culture of heaven, the covert expressions of ministry, how you love people, how you speak to people, how you regard one another, If we're going to build something, we have to build with someone else's preference in mind rather than our own. Good? Overt ministries are the things that are done openly, plainly, and readily apparent. That's healing the sick, raising the dead, publicly proclaiming the gospel. Like, these things are fantastic. They're definitely a piece. As a matter of fact, they're a command. But covert ministry are the things that aren't openly acknowledged, but they lay the foundation for everything else. We aren't wrong in focusing on overt ministry, the healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, but we are leaving something very important on the table if we neglect Jesus' emphasis on covert ministry, the stuff that Jesus displayed regarding how heaven does life and and, and what the heart of heaven cares about. Overt witness, excuse me, overt ministry is witnessed, Covert ministry is experienced. Get it? I saw you heal the sick. I felt you forgive me. I heard you share a prophetic word over the church that came to pass was super accurate, but I felt you regard me above yourself when we had a moment where we didn't agree. Overt ministry is witnessed. Covert ministry is experienced. I had a dream years ago that we had nine caskets in the parking lot. And all nine of those people were lifted from their caskets by members of Legacy Church. And it was recorded and it was put on Facebook. 
and it was trending for about a half an hour. And then people scrolled by. Right? There have been millions, millions of supernatural heavenly exploits done through and in the name of Jesus over the last 2,000 years. And the kingdom of God is still not manifest on earth. Right? So at some point, you have to admit to yourself that we've emphasized the wrong thing. Yep. It's not that it's not important. It's not that it's not good, but it's not best. Make sense? Jesus spent three and a half years doing nothing but displaying the kingdom of God on earth. He was constantly using covert ministry tactics to make the culture able to handle the covenant that was coming. He knew that the conditioning of humanity under the law was not able to embrace the freedom humanity would experience under grace. And he did five things really well in order to change the culture of the world. Number one, he was familiar with what heaven valued. He knew heaven's culture, right? Let me sidebar for a moment. We had a prophet four years ago give us some language to distinguish. Hmm, how do I say this the right way? if we were seeing what God was intending for us, right? He said, there are people that will come to legacy because of your fire. And some of them will desire to burn with you. And some of them, some of them will desire to be made warm by your heat. Okay? There will be people that were, are involved. And then there will be people that feel counterfeit involvement because of their proximity. So I highly suggest that you evaluate whether or not you're burning or whether or not you're being warmed. Okay? There's a difference. Adam was being warmed. He became a life, or excuse me, he became a living soul because of what he got from Jesus. Jesus was a life-giving spirit. He was the source. So it's important that you understand when God is doing something in the earth, your responsibility is to stay with his momentum. Think about this. Jesus was a good shepherd, but his invitation to his sheep was, follow me. And most of the time when people are in a church, they think the invitation is not to follow, but to call the leadership back to them. Get it? Are you burning? Are you being warmed? Are you helping produce this culture? Or are you just benefiting from it because you're close by? These are tough questions, right? Number two, Jesus regularly modeled the culture of heaven. That's what made him a spectacle. As a matter of fact, that's what made him an offense to religious people. Religious people were offended by Jesus because he expressed the Father, and by expressing the Father, he brought into question the attitudes and, and attributes of religious people. And after knowing and demonstrating the culture, he regularly communicated the culture. Right? One of the best things that you can learn how to do is just explain heaven. It doesn't have to be weird, but if Jesus began most of his teachings with the kingdom of God is like, then you should be able to explain why you can forgive somebody that's unforgivable. You should be able to explain why you're still in a relationship with somebody that maybe you've had a few bumps with, right? What I mean by that is people, should, we should do an entire, as a matter of fact, we will. Uh, in this series, we'll talk about defining relationships with your fellow human because you don't have to be best friends with everyone, right? That's... That's something that Jesus modeled, and it's useful to know because if people aren't your best friend, then you won't get upset about it. You're supposed to have best friends, just not everybody. Good? So Jesus knew the culture of heaven. He modeled the culture of heaven. He communicated the culture of heaven, and then here's the other thing that he was willing to do, and this, this requires both responsibility on one end and humility on the other. He corrected drifts in his culture, right? You ready for this one? Do you remember in the Old Testament... When there is, there is history of God sending fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, 
I'm just going to make you think about this one. I'm not going to give you theology for it, but I'm going to make you think about this, okay? So there were people casting out demons in the New Testament that weren't part of Jesus' and the disciples' group. And they said, do you want us to call down fire on them? And Jesus says, I know not what spirit you're of. Father doesn't send fire down on people. Okay? I'll leave that sit with you. But here's the point. If you are acting outside of the culture of heaven and you are confronted by somebody that knows that it is your desire to manifest the culture of heaven, then you have to be humble enough to allow that correction to bring you back into Christ's nature. Good? Jesus regularly rebuked religious people and rebuked his sons because he was bringing them into responsibility to finish the work that he started. Good? Last thing, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. The fifth thing that Jesus did well is taught that you should celebrate your culture. One of the things that I've failed at miserably over the last 10 years in the name of false humility or whatever it is, Jesus was very good about celebrating the culture of heaven. In Luke chapter 15, he told everybody, if, if a woman has nine coins and she loses one, won't she turn everything over in the house to bring back the coin that she lost? And then what happens? Heaven has a party. Yep. If, if a farmer has nine, or 100 sheep and he loses one, won't he leave the 99 to go get the one? Yep. Then what happens? Heaven has a party. Yep. If the, if the estranged son comes home to the father, what happens? Party. Yep. We need to get good at celebrating what God's doing in our midst. We need to recognize that we just made a friend in Russia. Yep. Who's going to bring this gospel to 1,100 people? Yep. We need to be excited that, that this gospel is going to make it into 75 million homes. We need to be excited that over 3,000 cities are listening to us, right? We need to be okay with realizing that God is doing something very special. And we need to continually and humbly handle what God is doing here, right? <clears throat> He was very good at celebrating his culture. But if you focus on these five things, I'm usually not this studious. It's usually a little bit more revelatory. I wanted this to start practical. It'll get good. I wanted it to start practical. But here's the deal. You have to reform your expectations of the future after you've reformed who you believe God is. If you believe God is good and you believe that you're in him, then you now have an assignment, right? Not an escape plan. Yeah. <laughs> And the best thing that the enemy could do to you is give you a noble and religious-sounding doctrine to ascribe to that makes you want to die more than it makes you want to live. Here's the saddest thing in the world. I've met at least a dozen youth kids that once they heard the Western gospel wanted to <clears throat> unlive themselves. Right? Why? Why? Because we tell them that they're going to suffer for the rest of their life. They'll get pulled through a knot hole backwards. They'll just hope that they make it, right? And then, and then, they'll stand before God in judgment. And then you have to hope that you make it again. And then, if you make it, then you get to go on to a pain-free, wealthy, loving, fun, right? They've literally made death the savior of the world. And when you deliver the wrong gospel, people desire the wrong outcome. But if you teach that Jesus was the Savior and that he took your pain, he took everything you were never meant to be, and he brought you to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that you could redeem creation back to him, the fun starts now, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <clears throat> it's never been about escaping. It's always been about occupying. Amen? All right, would you stand? You guys good? Hmm, I feel funny. No, not funny, haha. -ha. Like funny like you're not done. So when I feel funny, I ask Becca Stoneman to join me up here. <laughs> She's a piano player, by the way. She's not coming to preach or anything. 
Um, Last weekend, when I finished preaching, I was forced to my knees on this pulpit. And something took place. Something took place in that moment where we transitioned from expecting to receiving. I couldn't do anything. Like, I just want to explain it to you because I tried my best to maintain composure and integrity. So I was just trying to finish my... My Sunday morning, and I could not stay standing. And while I was down there, I lost my vision. You can probably see me on the live stream going like this. And I couldn't see any of you. And God just pulled me into a vision. And, and what he showed me was, you know, there was a moment when the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said, you're going to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And she said, let it be done unto me according to your word. And, and that acceptance of that invitation is what qualified Mary to carry. But then, like, there is a drastic difference. If any of you know this, like, if I tell you, I tell you you're going to be a millionaire, you're like, hey, that sounds fun, right? But the moment that you open your Chase bank account and you see nine zeros in there, then things change, right? You've gone from expecting to receiving. And last week, what I believe that Legacy Church navigated was knowing what we're expecting to looking down and literally seeing the baby bump literally knowing that we're carrying what heaven designed and desired for us to carry. So there's no more waiting. There's no more prolonging. Now there just is stewardship and responsibility, right? So I believe that this morning is supposed to be a commissioning, okay? And I just, I, I just used language that Prophet Josh Todd used, um, the difference between burning and being warmed. And I believe that God is calling people to a decision as to whether or not you're going to create the culture or you're going to benefit from it. Or you're going to burn or be warmed. Are you, are you willing to say the same thing that Mary said when the angel delivered this, this promise to her? Let it be done unto me according to your word. Because if, if we're going to steward what God has desired from before the foundation of the world, he, it, he brought it to a close, man. The man of God days are over. They're over. Like, they're not inviting me now. They're inviting us. It's no longer about a guy with a YouTube channel or a guy with a jet, right? It's not about traveling anymore. It's about people being brought to a family to be made part of an international sending center so they can take that culture back and, and take acres and take offspring and change what they're called to change. So I would ask you this this morning. Um, if today's the day, and I, I hate that, but if you're willing to take that step from being warmed to burning, from benefiting from the culture to helping create it. There's a big difference. <laughs> Creating that culture hurts. Benefiting from that culture feels good. But when you're creating that culture, you're the one that's taking the bullet. You're the one that's confessed. Watch this. I'll show you how heaven handles disappointment. I'll show you how heaven handles offense. I'll show you how handle, heaven handles disagreement. I'll show you how a husband loves his wife. That's what it means to be part of this culture. So the invitation is this. If you want to come from being warmed to being on fire, just raise your hand so you can remember this, this day. If you have your hand in the air, I want you to close your eyes and simply acknowledge, maintain an awareness of the presence of God that's here. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for the angels that you've established over this house 
we honor and recognize them. We thank you that New Philadelphia is an international sending center for the gospel of the kingdom. Father, everybody, including myself and my family, we're choosing to be creators. We're choosing to burn here. We're choosing to be immovable in our view of a good God. We're choosing to be immovable in our hope of a bright and ever-increasing kingdom in the future. We're choosing to be immovable in our responsibility to bring the reality of heaven to earth and vanquish every enemy that you've already stepped on the throat of. Father, we've already said, let it be done unto us. Father, now give us the grace to steward with compassion and wisdom what you've placed in this house. Father, our prayer, our model, our, our desire is heaven here, heaven now. Father, each one that's raised their hands, fill them right now. A recognizable encounter, everything they need. Everything they need for life and godliness. Everything they need for their assignment, Father. Let their life be divided into before this day and after this day. From expecting to carrying from desiring to stewarding. Father, there's no more preparation now. We step into your truth. We believe your word. Or we receive our assignment in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a shout this morning.